vibrant because of the, the stewardship of Manny mm -hmm. you know, it can really improve even even more from where we are right now. Well, and uh, Chris, I want, I want to bring you into this as well. And But I also want to ask you this, because you've been covering this, and the, there was some thought that this year, uh, given the changes in demographics, the changes in the city uh, in total, that uh, uh, we, we weren't necessarily going to uh, elect uh, another uh, white Irish Catholic uh, uh, man, and, and not to, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, put that down, but uh, looking at those numbers, yeah. it's looking like uh, uh, we may be going back to those years. I mean, it, the numbers are fluctuating right now. We don't know what we're going to see with uh, Charlotte Golar Ritchie, of course. Uh, you know, John Barrows, who surged, as everyone's saying, and of course got half of the Globe endorsement. Uh, the, the, there just wasn't the get-out-the-vote effort. So, you know, I was at several... Uh, several precincts today and you know even in Dorchester where I'd written a column a couple weeks ago about how the race there was really a four-person race with Bill Walczak, um, you know after uh, Marty and, uh, and and John Barros and Charlotte of course but you know even that really just didn't seem to come together the, the Barros people weren't there maybe a few signs uh, I also just want to say as far if we're talking about labor uh, really, I think that the teachers are the ones to watch it at, at this point uh, Marty Walsh has you know every time every chance every time he's been asked um, when did you not, you know, when did you, you know, tell, uh, you know, when did you really stand up to labor? He's used the teacher's contract as an example, or he's used the uh, Boston Teachers Union mm -hmm. uh, as an example. And uh, really, and then we're talking John Conley on the other side, who, of course, almost took an, endor took an endorsement from Stanford Children. Uh, I bet that money's about to be back in play. That's, of course, you know, corporate education reform. Mm -hmm. Once again, back to, you know, who are the players behind that? Bain Capital, Walmart. Uh, I think these are all issues that were kind of, really uh, tangential in the run-up to this. But now, you know, it's not going to be popular to not be friends with the Boston Teachers Union anymore. Um, this, is, this is a massive force. Uh, you know, of course, they endorsed in, in this race uh, Felix Arroyo and Rob Consalvo. Right. But, you know, I, I didn't see them out there with any particular placards or today. In, with T-shirts yeah. in force yeah. today. Uh, but watch, you know, I, I can't wait to see how that moves forward. Yeah. That's a huge, you know, piece of this puzzle. Well, we've, we've got just a couple of minutes uh, yet, uh, and again, uh, joining us uh, live in studio, uh, the president, the uh, uh, professional firefighters of Massachusetts. We're talking about Ed Kelly, uh, who's a Boston boy, and of course, uh, our good friend, uh, Chris Ferrone, uh, now a freelance journalist, but uh, never seems to hold anything back. Uh, uh, the numbers at this point uh, showing in the mayor's race, this is that uh, uh, Marty Walsh on top. Again, uh, this is now with uh, uh, nearly 60% of the uh, returns in. These are unofficial returns, but uh, coming through the city of Boston, uh, showing him holding on to a lead. Uh, John Connolly creeping up now, nearing 19%. Charlotte Golar Ritchie at 12%. And Suffolk DA Dan Connolly in fourth place, uh, a little over 11%. Uh, do we have the I'm not sure if we have the results uh, for the others. We'll bring those to you uh, uh, very shortly. Guys, we've got just a, a, a couple minutes left. Uh, uh, shape this race for us. If, if it's the uh, top two, oh, and I, I, here we go. We've got some uh, numbers for this is the at-large city council race. The top eight go on to the final, and you can see Michael Flaherty, uh, of course, former council, former council president, Ian Presley. Uh, who's our current counselor, Steve Murphy, current counselor, Michelle Wu, a, a kind of a bright uh, young candidate that uh, showed up on the scene, uh, Jack Kelly coming out of Charlestown, seems to be doing quite well there. Uh, again, these are s small percentages. Uh, Isabi George, uh, uh, Nisa Isabi George, uh, Marty Keo is in there, and Jeff Ross, an activist, uh, political activist, Catherine Neal, is uh, ninth at this point, and Althea Garrison, perennial candidate, uh, they're at tenth. This is out of 19 candidates, uh, a rather large field, and uh, I'm not sure if we have uh, any of the district races. Uh, this is District 8, and uh, this is, is the same number we reported earlier. This is with only 4.5% of the precincts reporting. Uh, Josh Zakem. Uh, with a huge lead in that race. Again, the top two go on. At this point, it's uh, very close for the second spot between uh, realtor Tom Dooley and Michael Nichols, who's the chief of staff at, uh, at the Boston City Council. Again, those are very early numbers in that race. 
And we're also following, of course, a District 5 race. That's an open seat. That is the seat given up by um, Rob Consalvo. That's got eight candidates. It's also a District 4 race and one in District 1 involving incumbents. Guys, shape this race. We've got just a couple minutes left here. Uh, shape this race. If it's Walsh and Connolly, what, what are the issues that emerge in your mind? Very quickly, Eddie Kelly. I think that, you know, John Connolly has did a good job of establishing himself as the school's candidate, but I think schools are important to everybody, whether you're looking at it as the economic engine of the future or the trouble that we have right now. But Marty Walsh is another person that, f that has a plan for the schools and, and focused on the schools, and as we said, you know, um, has taken some tough votes on that, but the schools have about 100,000 students, and a lot of them, are, a lot of the probably 50,000 parents. So that means there's another 600,000 residents in the city that that have a lot of other issues. I think crime is a major problem in the city, public safety in general. And when you think about what people pay their taxes for, what they want in return for them, you know, if you don't have your kids in a public school, you want to make sure that your roads and your bridges, that your infrastructure, that the future of the city is in good hands and that you focus on economic development, but also that if you pick up the phone to dial 911, you're getting the best services that you can. And, and Chris Ferrone did uh, John Connolly perhaps, well, uh, he's second according to those numbers. Yeah. Again, uh, still a little more than half, half of the vote in, but uh, did he make a mistake by putting all his uh, eggs in one basket uh, Focusing so heavily on schools? Not if he makes it through tonight. I mean, that's I mean, when you literally overhearing people speaking about him. You know, they, you know, he's the education candidate. Whether it's true or not, or uh, that's what he's seen as, and I think it's helped. But I think that the really the two things, if it let's say if it is Walsh and Connolly, the two things to look at going forward are um, one, the the Boston Teachers Union, like I said, two, Hyde Park. Who gets the support of Hyde Park? This is this is a fifth of the electorate. This is uh, Mayor Menino's backyard. You're talking about Hyde Park or are you talking about Mayor Menino's machine? I mean both, but I mean Hyde Park also. I mean, you know, Hyde Park is really split here. We have former, you know, Con uh, Dan Conley used to be the councilor there. Of course, he moved on up to West mm -hmm. Roxbury. Uh, and then and then, and Rob Gonsalvo. The, Hyde Park is, uh, you know, if you look at that heat map that the Globe put up, everybody's voting. Uh, Southie, I understand the vote wasn't uh, what people expected. Hyde Park's still there. Who's going to get Hyde Park, uh, judging by the... Uh, relationships between the candidates and the mayor. Um, uh, I think we could come to some conclusions about that, but I guess it really does have yet to be seen. Well, uh, again, uh, tonight on uh, this special edition of Talking the Neighborhoods, we're, we're waiting. We're, like all of you, following the results. The numbers are pouring in. Uh, the uh, early returns are showing some, um, some that many expected to finish well, doing well. Others, not so. Um, we'll be getting more of those returns as we continue our coverage. We're going to go now back to my colleague, uh, uh, guest host Seth McCoy, joins us with a couple of very special guests to talk more about today's election. Seth? Thanks, Joe. Uh, joining me now, Kevin Peterson, Barry Lawton, and on the phone, Representative Carlos Enriquez. Carlos, are you there? How are you? Because you're, you're out there on the campaign trail. Uh, for folks at home who don't know, you were actively supporting John Barrow, so you've been working very hard trying to get him to the final two. Um, Kevin and Barry have been working on Charlotte's behalf. As it looks right now, we're looking at a final between Marty Walsh and John Connolly. Uh, Charlotte is, at this point in time, uh, pulling in third place. Anything, uh, I'll start with you, Kevin, anything about today surprising you? How do you feel about where your candidate is ending up or looks to be ending up? Well, I'm a bit surprised uh, that she has, um, uh, her ground campaign uh, has not um, uh, exhibited the strength that others uh, expected uh, her campaign to produce at this point in time. Uh, uh, it was projected that she would be able to win a plurality of her uh, base precincts. There are about 65 to, to, to 80, 80 precincts that were critical mm -hmm. for her to win. Um, it appears that the campaign uh, has not generated en enough energy mm -hmm. uh, during, during the day to produce that. Now the results are not in right. and um, historically uh, just in terms of being a mechanic around this sort of stuff, black precincts usually come in uh, towards the end of the day. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no prejudice or discrimination <laughs> about that. 
Uh, but uh, so, so there's still uh, opportunity to see a win for Charlotte Ritchie, and I'm, I'm hoping that that's the fact. And Representative Enriquez, you, as I mentioned, were supporting uh, John Barros. How do you feel his game went today? Obviously, a lot of people are talking about what really matters is the get out the vote today, not everything that led up to today. John had a great endorsement by the Boston Globe. What do you think could have been done differently in, in that campaign? Well, I, you know, I, I want to make say, you know, thanks for having me on too. I, I'm still getting a little. I think I can still hear Joe's Joe's mic in my in my ear, so I'm, I'm listening to two conversations. Um, but for uh, you know, I wish we had if we had maybe a, another week or two, another month. You know, I think we just I think John ran a great campaign. Um, you know, the the endorsements from the large groups are fine. We really been it's really been a campaign focused on grassroots. Um, you know, and it's a little, it's a little bit of an enigma this campaign. You know, you, to have so many qualified candidates on the, on the ballot um, for people to look at, some with more name recognition than others because of their elected positions. You know, all, all that stuff plays. So, you know, I, I'm not mad at the effort at all. You know, uh, much like Kevin just said, you know, we're still we're still watching the results come in. Um, and, and like he said, you know, we we are still banking on some high high wards and precincts that might come out in our favor and hopefully tip the scale. So we'll, we'll keep hope until the last minute. Um, but I think the campaign, you know, obviously the goal is to win. Um, but what I've seen the campaign do um, for different people all across Boston, but specifically for the district I represent as well, has just been phenomenal. Yeah. It, yeah, it's been a great um, burst of energy for everybody to, be, everybody to be talking about all the candidates, certainly with a number that's great. It was hard to hear from the different candidates what their positions were, if they were different from X candidate versus Y candidate. Barry, there's going to be, regardless of where Charlotte turns up, where John Barrows turns out, we're going to have a new mayor. What does that mean to you? Well, I think that means that the, uh, there will be a new energy in the office, uh, a, a new zeal. Uh, I think things that uh, things will happen very quickly. Uh, we will see that probably materialize when we uh, come up with the final uh, results from tonight. Um, but I think you know overall, um, the, and I want to address a little bit of what uh, Representative Enrique says about uh, about it being a good effort. Uh, it, it's a good and a poor effort um, because you know for communities of color. Uh, have not, because of the turnout uh, and, and the disconnect and, and, and the new Bostonians that are coming in, they have not been able to coalesce around a message or around a unity of purpose. So there was the ability to be able to run a relay race and get across the finish line first. Mm -hmm. uh, and at, at some point, you know, we had that conversation. There was a lot of hypersensitivity right. uh, to even having that conversation. But, you know, basic math. Um, would dictate the logic and even examining examining that type of thing. So uh, I, I'm, I'm very excited about what's going to be coming up because now uh, if, if the results hold up uh, currently the way they are, uh, we're going to have two uh, candidates that are going to have to have a very different conversation uh, with, with Boston. Mm -hmm. getting, back to, getting back to what you were just saying, though, about coalescing behind one particular candidate, do you think that needs to happen a lot sooner than certainly there was discussion uh, just, what, a few weeks ago to rally behind your candidate, Charlotte, and whether or not that conversation needs to happen, for example, tomorrow or Sir, four years from now? Absolutely. Uh, as we had a conversation in the primary among minority candidates, mm -hmm. uh, uh, so-called minority candidates should have that conversation tomorrow because mm -hmm. there are certain and specific needs uh, that are uh, specific to the um, to to minority uh, communities mm -hmm. uh, that now need to be put on the table in terms of how the mayoral race progresses. Uh, so uh, if the trends hold out as they are now, uh, the wiser people in our community should be prepared to have a conversation tomorrow about what it means to be black or Latino or Cape Verdean mm -hmm. in this city in terms of education and jobs and housing. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's an immediate concern that I would push for uh, as early as tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, there is nothing wrong in and of itself for, for uh, specific groups to be talking about uh, how they can coalesce to uh, uh, impact um, political races in terms of their uh, concentrated power. Right. That's what we talked about in terms of the black community weeks ago. That conversation needs to um, to be advanced into this um, this final. 
Representative, always, do you think that, would you agree that that conversation needs to happen ASAP so that the community can be on the same page and move forward the agenda um, that will benefit the community? Absolutely. Um, you know, and I agree, you're, you're, you're sitting with, um, you know, two of the amazing um, uh, constituents that live in the same district as myself, the same uh, representative district. Uh, and I think that conversation should start tomorrow. I would love to have breakfast with whoever wants to have that conversation. I think, I think it starts tomorrow and continues consistently all the way through. And I don't think we're waiting for four years. I think we're looking at state race, statewide races next year. I think we're looking at, you know, state races next year. I think we're looking at municipal elections next year after that. And it should be a, a continuous conversation that we have. Um, so I'm, I'm more than happy to, to sit down with, with uh, Barry and sit down with Kevin and, and everybody that wants to come to the table to figure out how we fix the, the disproportionate um, ills that, that affect our communities differently than other communities Absolutely. in Boston. Absolutely. One of the things, though, I want to bring up is that there was also a forum that excluded non-minority candidates. Is this something that you think is helpful moving forward? Because um, I'm going to editorialize here. I don't think it's helpful at yeah. all. I think we need to be a city that's united and doing things like that does nothing to advance anybody's yeah. agenda. I, I, you know, I, I, don't, I think it's less and less about color. I mean, I think you uh, have seen it in some of the races. If you looked at the special election with uh, uh, Nick Collins and Linda Dorsina, uh, there was a lot of crossover there. Um, people are uh, identifying more with the message now than the messenger because you know you have this this salesman type things, and and, and you need leadership. Um, so they're looking for ideas. So I think color is less important um, in that aspect. But in the other aspect. When you look at the unity, uh, at, at the problems that are common to people of color, I mean, it could be any kind of people living in those communities that they're effective. You, you've got infrastructure problems, you've got employment problems, you have public safety problems, public health problems. These need to be addressed. And although some of these are state issues, the city needs to be a more in an advocacy role uh, to bring more resources back to our community. Well, and Seth, I, would, I think um, the representative would agree that had South Boston held such a uh, forum, uh, he, Barry, and myself would have been out, outraged. Oh, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. So when I heard about this, we would have crashed it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so so when I heard about this forum uh, being held at the Freedom House, uh, which is an historically um, uh, historic institution within our, within our community that really was established around racism in South Boston schools and mm -hmm. education, uh, I was outraged. So my, my, my response to that is that um, uh, Boston should no longer hold any forms which are racially exclusionary. I agree. And I, 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 don't, I don't know if that was their intention to do that. I think that they were, yeah, uh, you know, neophytes in the, in the forum game, right. and, and they wanted to try to have a conversation to put issues on the table that weren't on the table. Which I think you hit the nail on the head, though, in that a lot of those issues that they want to bring up, or this group wanted to bring up, are issues that impact all residents of Boston right. in some form or, or another. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. obviously, um, you know, to different extents, depending on where you are in the city, but they're issues that we can all relate to and all want addressed. Right. I just want to mention real quickly that we do have some final numbers for District 1, which of course is the North End, East Boston, uh, Charlestown, and parts of Beacon Hill, and that is Sal Lamatina and Brian Gannon are the top two vote getters. Uh, and also the mayor's race, we do have 95% reporting, and right now it's Walsh Connolly, and that's John Connolly. Uh, third is Charlotte Gola Ritchie, and fourth is Dan Connolly. So not much changing since we first started the program this evening. Um, but, but it was a little bit of a surprise. We, we, we did not expect Marty Walsh to be first, and, we, and, and uh, coming in today, uh, uh, we didn't expect Charlotte Goulart Ritchie to be at 13. She was a uh, expected to be at around 11 or 12 and uh, just eke out whoever, whoever was the um, second place. Why do you finisher. think she had such a surge at the end here? Um, I, I think it was just more education. I think that uh, you know after uh, Labor Day, people started focusing on the campaign a little bit more, and and they started to look at the paradigm of, of the mayor's office and and, and seeing that there, there was a change. This was a very short race. Mm -hmm. Reality creates its own structure. So you know the traditional ways of campaigning went out the door when you had a six month campaign to do this. But I expect that tomorrow, uh, after tomorrow, it'll be a more orderly campaign and. Uh, and there'll be a, uh, ample opportunity for uh, 
um, for people of color and, and other constituencies across uh, the community uh, to get their uh, issues on the table. I will say that I live on Fort Hill and I was probably hit with a piece from Charlotte every single day this past week. So. If that it showed anything. it showed a significant well, the post surge. Office is happy. Yeah, sure. <laughs> well, these yeah. were not even mailers. This no. was yeah. hand delivery, yeah. like on the yeah. porch. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so. it shows a, a significant surge in our campaign. Yeah. Um, the, the unfortunate thing is that Charlotte got into the race late. I, I believe the latest. Yes. Uh, so, that true. Um, had she made the decision a month earlier, she may have been a little more competitive. Absolutely. Uh, today. How, do we think that the commercial that was put out, um, Lewis Gossett Jr. was the star of, if you will, was that helpful? Um, some people that I spoke to found it a little off-putting. They, they felt that we were maybe reverting back to 1970s Boston and not looking to the future as to where the city has come and where it can go. may have been a little anachronistic. Um, my you know, feedback I heard from you know, being a, an advisor to the campaign and a, and a volunteer to the campaign, by the way, was that... Um, their memory of Louis Gossett Jr. Uh, re re reverts back to the uh, series Roots, mm -hmm. where uh, he right. played uh, not Chicken George but um, Fiddler. So <laughs> it was it was anachronistic in terms of it just reverting back to a, a very historic series, but one that went back to the 70s. Yeah. And a lot of young Bostonians, in particular didn't make, 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 make the connection. That's exactly who I'm talking about, the yeah. young Bostonians. Representative, did you um, find the same to be true? Were people, uh, did you hear that people were put off by that commercial, or uh, do you have any no, thoughts not, about not it? No, not at all. I, you know, I, I tested, I, I asked a lot of uh, people younger than me, and, and uh, you know, I was joking around, I said, who do you like better, Danny Glover or Lou Gossett? And the thing on your age group bracket, most people under 30 said, who? <laughs> um, but I don't think it was divisive in any way, and, I, and I, you know, I think this, that both Charlotte and John caught fire um, later on, but I think they both surged at a good time. You know, I thought we surged, and I, and I think Charlotte, I think Charlotte really surged um, after the Boston Herald um, televised debate. I think she really found her niche and went from there. Um, but I do have to say my candidate just walked in, and I, I need to give this man a hug. Um, yes. So I, I want to bid you guys farewell and, and say thank you. Well, we want to um, thank you for calling in. As to always. My two constituents, I would love to meet with you guys for breakfast, so please let me know when and I'll be there. Tomorrow morning, we can. You guys can call, you you. Can call each other after the show and figure it out. But I want to thank we'll you so do. much for being here on the phone. And um, do tell John oh we wish him God. well, and I'm sure we'll be hearing from him down the line. Um, this is our numbers guy, by the way, who's uh, <laughs> You're getting numbers calling us, in right now. Getting us uh, updates on, uh, on how people are doing and where. So I think we have um, some final, or 96% of the at-large uh, candidates reporting. So uh, right now on your screen are the four result, the top four for mayor. That's Marty Walsh, John Conley, Charlotte Gola Ritchie, and Dan Connolly. Um, do we have the numbers for the at-large? So results right now with 96% reporting, 95.5% actually, is Ayanna Presley, Michael Flaherty, Councillor Murphy, Michelle Wu, Marty Keough, Jeff Ross, Anissa Asabi George, Jack Kelly, Catherine O'Neill, and Althea What's Garrison. What's so impressive for, for, uh, for me uh, among that list is the resurgence of Flaherty. Absolutely. Are uh -huh. you surprised at that? Uh, it, it's impressive. I am surprised that yep. he is running within less of one percentage point of the city yep. council uh, at large candidate. Yeah, and who I wanna, won by a large margin. Yeah, outstanding right. years, by uh, Michelle Wu, which is you know right. just really a, 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 a outstanding effort. And I want to mention that from here we go down to eight. So Jack Kelly is in the eighth spot, and Catherine O'Neill right now is in the ninth spot. So. We might see some adjustments there. There's actually, it's pretty tight between uh, Anissa, Jack, and Catherine. So those could fluctuate a little bit. Um, but for the most part, that looks like what may be the final eight. Mm -hmm. okay. There are some real newcomers, uh, including Wu, but also Marty Keogh, who worked in the city council some yep. years ago. For uh, Peggy uh, Davis Muller. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, he, he looks to, he, he's having an he's impressive been, He's show. been ubiquitous. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Jeff Ross is also a newcomer. He's a, he was state committee, but uh, he obviously saw an opportunity to run for a, a liberal at out large. of the South End, yeah. yep. who, who, who will um, who will um, uh, be challenged in some ways he will, within the liberal campaigning with, hard as well. Within, I mean, with all of them, you know, yeah. are really a good 
crop of candidates, and I think that that's going to bode well for turnout yeah. Yeah. Uh, in November. Absolutely. We also have 100% of District 8 reporting, reporting, which is Back Bay, Beacon Hill, Fenway, and Mission Hill, and Josh Zakum uh, is the top vote getter there, followed by Mike Nichols. Um, so that probably not too surprising there. I think people pretty much had that called well, you down know, the line. You know, Lenny, Lenny did an awful lot for this community, and uh, you know, he, he raised Josh. You know, I'm sure the same way. <laughs> so uh, we're, we're looking forward to uh, uh, his campaign and ultimately his uh, election. Absolutely. What do you guys think is going to be the top concern? Uh, as the candidates for mayor, as it looks now, Marty Walsh, John Connolly, what do you think their game is going to be now? Obviously, there are a lot of votes that they're going to need to go after from the different candidates that were in this race. So if you were advising them, what is the well, first piece of advice? Briefly, if you, if you don't mind, uh, Barry, briefly, I think the overall theme is innovation. So there's innovation in housing and, and education, innovation in city services. Um, uh, so the overall theme, as, as I see it, how do we take this city uh, to a new level in an innovative way, uh, using uh, uh, new technologies uh, and a new sense of uh, how cities move forward? Boston is probably one of the top ten cities, not in the city, but in the world. Right. Uh, so how do we use this uh, innovation uh, concept? Uh, and move the city forward. Yep, Barry? Uh, I would look at uh, less of tinkering and, and, and a, a more uh, comprehensive view of, of running the city because there are many issues that are interrelated. And when you look at the crime and the public safety issue, that is directly related to the school. When you look at the school issue, I know a lot of the uh, burden falls on the teachers, but you know we only have the kids 34 hours a, a, a week. So a lot of it has to do with with outside. You need to come up with ideas that have worked, New Deal programs to help us rebuild our infrastructure. Those types of conversations, good ideas that will resonate. And I think when you had so many candidates in such a short campaign, uh, ideas, it was very hard to get them out. I think right now there's going to be a greater demand um, for, for tangible ideas and not just uh, you know chicken in every pot. How are we going to get there? How are we going to pay for it? Well, and obviously a lot of what's going to happen next are those two candidates, top vote getters, are going to be going after the candidates who didn't finish in the top two spots. Do you have any inclination as to where Charlotte may go? Too early to say. Uh, if you were advising her, calling her up right now and saying, I think you should back this person, who would that be? Well, it, it's, it's not too early to say. I, I, I think uh, it is early enough to say that um, uh, Charlotte should be li uh, looking at the best interest of those people, looking after the best interest of those people who supported her. Mm -hmm. uh, and so as she begins to bargain, um, to, to engage with the, with the other uh, top-tier candidates. Uh, she should be mindful that she has a, a significant constituency mm -hmm. and, that, um, and that she should be uh, engaging and bargaining and, bar bargaining and um, uh, looking forward to it, towards the rest of this, this campaign in terms of what she can deliver for those people who supported her. Absolutely. Mostly. Kevin Peterson, I want to thank you. Barry Lawton, I want to thank you. Representative Carlos Enriquez was on the phone. And right now I'm going to toss it back to Joe Heisler. Joe, take it away. All right, we're back in studio with more of this special edition of Talking the Neighborhoods tonight, election 2013. And the field is nearly set. Uh, certainly it looks to be the case. Uh, the number's now nearing 100%. And uh, as uh, Seth updated you on several of those races, uh, uh, the top finishers that will go on to the final election in November are becoming clearer and clearer, although earlier today I don't think uh, anybody could have told you for certain who would be uh, finishing in the top. Uh, again, let's go through some of the numbers here. Uh, very quickly, uh, District 1, uh, the incumbent cell on Matina, no surprise there, uh, uh, seems to be sweeping the field. His uh, nearest opponent, uh, anti-casino activist Brian Gannon, uh, is currently in second, John Ribeiro, a businessman in third. Uh, that may portend uh, uh, somewhat of what we may see in the uh, referendum on the casino vote. And in District 8, again, this is with 100% reporting. And uh, Josh Zakem, uh, the scion of uh, renowned uh, uh, 
uh, anti-discrimination uh, uh, activist, uh, Lenny Zakem, the late Lenny Zakem, uh, clearly uh, with a huge lead there, 45%. Michael Nichols, who is the chief of staff of the Boston City Council, uh, seems to be comfortably in second. Gloria Murray, Tom Dooley, Angelica Advinola is uh, last in that. And uh, if we have the other districts, uh, well, let's first go to the at-large race. And uh, this is uh, nearly complete but uh, this is roughly 96% reporting, and uh, as expected, Diana Presley topping the field. Michael Flaherty attempting a comeback yet again, uh, appears to be on his way, uh, comfortably in second place. Steve Murphy, the city council president, in third, and uh, Michelle Wu, a newcomer, Harvard Law School graduate, former city employee, uh, doing very well, appears to be in fourth place. The rest of the field, uh, Attorney Marty Keel is fifth. Uh, Jeff Ross, a political activist, uh, in sixth. Uh, Saibi uh, George Anissa uh, in seventh. And uh, Jack Kelly from uh, uh, Charlestown in eighth. And that would be the, uh, where the cutoff would be for the runoff. The top eight go on in the large race. Catherine O'Neill, former colleague of ours here at BNN, TV and a playwright and uh, Dorchester political activist uh, in ninth. Uh, that may not be set yet, depending upon where the votes that are left to be counted are coming in. Um, in tenth, uh, perennial candidate Althea Garrison. And now we go back to uh, the uh, results for the uh, in the mayor's race, and this is nearly complete as well. And uh, as he has all night, uh, Marty Walsh, State Representative Marty Walsh from Savin Hill, Dorchester, uh, holding on to the lead. Uh, John Conley, uh, the uh, at-large counselor from West Roxbury, who's been in second, still there, uh, creeping up a little closer. Charlotte Golar Ritchie, former state representative, back uh, into third place and uh, where she's been holding on all night. And Dan Conley, the Suffolk DA, still in fourth place. Uh, and that looks nearly set as well. Again, these are unofficial returns, yet they're coming uh, from, the, uh, from Boston City Hall, and we believe they will be uh, verified and accurate. Uh, joining me now, live in studio uh, from the uh, north end of Boston, uh, State Representative uh, uh, Aaron Michaelwitz, and he is, of course, the uh, chair of the Public Service Committee in the House mm -hmm. of Representatives now, and uh, a uh, early endorsee of uh, Charlotte Golar Ritchie, mm -hmm. and so uh, that's got to be uh, somewhat disappointing to see those results. Certainly it was. I mean, it's, uh, it, was, it was a long day, uh, you know, and I'm glad to be finishing up with you here today, so oh. thank you for having me on. Uh, but yeah, you know, I think we, we had high hopes going into the day, and as the, uh, the turnout numbers were coming in, I think we, we were feeling good uh, about the, uh, our prospects, and numbers shook out, and they didn't shake out our way. I, you know, I, I want to personally congratulate uh, Marty Walsh and uh, John Conley. I think they ran tremendous campaigns over the last, uh, you know, over the last over the summer and into the, into the early fall, uh, and they should, uh, you know, and, and I think they ran the best two campaigns in the election, and I think it showed on election day. Well, it, you know, I think, uh, and I mentioned this at the top of this segment. You know, no one knew, and uh, uh, the the few polls that had been done showed it so close, and the margin of error um, encompassed almost eight, nine candidates right. that could have theoretically been in this, so there wasn't as much polling this year as there has been in years past, and perhaps that was part of it, the fact that there was, the field had narrowed quite as much as, as it might normally have. Well, it's, it's funny that the, the poll, the original poll, or the, one of the first polls that came out was the, uh, you know, the Suffolk University mm -hmm. Boston Herald poll that came out back in early July, and it had John Conley and Marty Walsh one and two. And here we are today on election day, and it's still John Conley, but now Marty Walsh maybe number one. Uh, but both of those two candidates uh, you know, were the ones that ended up finishing one and two. So even though, after though, though your candidate in those early polls uh, was well, I won't say it was negligible, but it was very small, and and perhaps she showed the most growth. But uh, uh, looking at the numbers, and if you look at race, ethnicity, neighborhoods. You know, it's it's uh, there's nothing definitive yet. Many people thought this was the year that a uh, candidate of color uh, would be successful. Certainly, make the uh, runoff. Uh, 
What happened there? Is it, uh... You know, I think she, she did end up catching fire towards the end, uh, which moved her from single digits in kind of in the second tier up to the first tier and eventually in third place. And she was in third place or, or basically second or third, depending on which poll you looked at uh, over the last week. Uh, I think maybe, you know, in somewhat respect, she ran out of time uh, or didn't catch fire early enough uh, and wasn't able to move the needle quick, quicker enough to get her into the... Uh, you know, near the top spot as, mm -hmm. you know, as we got to election day. Uh, but I think, you know, uh, I haven't really delved through the numbers yet, mm -hmm. so it's hard, to, it's hard to say exactly where, well, in, where in, she did well, where she didn't yeah, do well, you know. In, in, in your own neighborhood. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I think that, in, in not to pick on, uh, you know, the North End mm -hmm. per se, or downtown per se, uh, but uh, those neighborhoods where there wasn't a candidate that yeah. hailed from it, it wasn't part of their thing. Uh, how did you see it uh, kind of breaking down? Could you see this pattern emerging? Uh, yeah, I mean, throughout the summer, uh, you had two, you know, with John Conley and Marty Walsh, you had both, uh, you know, people in my neighborhood worked very hard, uh, and I want to congratulate them as well for mm -hmm. their, you know, hard, their hard work. Did they say, Aaron, what are you doing? Well, no, they think, I think I shocked a couple people by, <laughs> by supporting uh, Charlotte at first, but I think once people met her and saw her, I think we, we ended up uh, th finishing about third, I think, in the North End. Uh, alone, so I think people once they met her and saw her, I think she did resonate uh, across neighborhood lines. It didn't matter, you know, whether you were in a community of color or in a a majority white neighborhood mm -hmm. like myself. Uh, you know, she did. You know, she did resonate with people, uh, but it just, like I said, it just wasn't enough. And and uh, you know, you tip your hat to the uh, to the two that made it. Well, look ahead for us. Help us uh, to envision how this race unfolds. Mm -hmm. uh, um, when you first ran, you were in a very spirited race mm -hmm. and vote very split. A lot of candidates. Mm -hmm. uh, now we're down to two. Uh, how do you see this uh, race kind of breaking down on issues? Uh, uh, do you see uh, any patterns, uh, at least initially, looking at it? I think that you you will look to the fact that the two candidates have you know pretty differing views on um, on union issues. I would say, uh, you know, Marty is a very pro union. Um, uh, uh, advocate has always been, mm -hmm. you know, in the legislature and and in no and apologies, in, uh, no former, apologies for former for it. head of the building trades, uh, former head of the building trades, and has done, you know, has done a very good job advocating for those issues. Uh, and then you have John, who has, uh, you know, ad advocated for some for different things, especially with the uh, with his education policy, uh, in terms of potentially looking to um, uh, change up the game. In in, in uh, you know, with with the group Stand for Children was very supportive of him. While they didn't end up, uh, you know, giving him uh, dollars, he they ended up, uh, you know, supporting him, and he he went for that. Uh, that endorsement and that endorsement, uh, you know, really was a factor of of how he wanted to change educate the education policy of the of the city. Now that could end up, you know, that kind of discussion could end up butting heads with the teachers union. Obviously, the teachers union did not endorse uh, John in the in the primary. They also didn't endorse Marty because Marty yeah. has been, you know, pro charter school over mm -hmm. the years. But I can see you can see where where this is somewhat heading, and I think that that's the the most stark contrast uh, between the two um, uh, finalists. How about Mayor Menino's organization? He's kind of stayed on the sidelines. I, I think, kind of, you know, biting his tongue at times, if I, <laughs> if I could say so. Uh, um, perhaps the biggest, best organization in the city. Does does he get into this? Uh, Your yes is as good as mine. I'm going to be honest <laughs> with you. I don't know what the mayor is going to do. Uh, it's. Uh, I think we'll all we'll all be watching. Um, I think that he has, uh, you know, the, decided at least for the primary that it was best to. You know, let it play out, let it shake out, see where it went. Um, and uh, he's, so I think he's actually uh, actually went on the record, uh, from what I heard today, that he would not endorse in the final well, either. But uh, well, you some know, would say these are his uh, two least favored candidates in the race. I, I'm not sure if that's true, but uh, um, the mayor has proven always to be very politically savvy, <laughs> and I'm sure he will make a very savvy decision uh, when it comes to this uh, this decision uh, or maybe non-decision in yeah, this case. Well. And again, uh, joining me uh, in studio here, uh, uh, Representative uh, Aaron Michaelwitz from the uh, North End of Boston, uh, now the uh, chair of the uh, House Committee on Public Service. Is that a joint committee? Yes. A joint uh, uh, committee on public service. And uh, now we do have uh, some final numbers in the uh, mayor's race and uh, want to bring them to you at this time. This is with 100% of the precincts reporting and uh, the early results have uh, held true. Uh, Marty Walsh appears to be the uh, winner 
with uh, over 20,000 votes, 18.5%. John Connolly, very close behind, uh, a point and a fraction behind him. Uh, the at-large city councilor, 19,420, that's uh, 17%. Charlotte Golar Ritchie, uh, a very valiant effort uh, coming from uh, far down on the pack to finish third. Uh, unfortunately, only the top two move on to the, uh, the uh, final. And Suffolk DA, Dan Connolly, who some people picked as the uh, early favorite, certainly based on his uh, campaign funds, uh, uh, raised and had nearly a million dollars in his uh, campaign account, uh, advertised extensively. Uh, coming in now with 11.3%. And if we could, I uh, want to ask uh, our uh, crew here to uh, bring up the, uh, the others as well. This is, uh, uh, we're going out of the at-large race, but we're going, going to have the numbers uh, for the other candidates in the mayor's race shortly. And this also is a final now with 100% reporting. Uh, Ayanna Presley, uh, uh, who topped the ticket uh, uh, two years ago, again, in this race, certainly topping the ticket. Uh, Michael Flaherty making a comeback after his failure to get uh, elected last term, last two years ago. Stephen Murphy, council president, strong third. Uh, Michelle Wu, a newcomer, a bright young face, young talent, uh, in comfortably in fourth place, at least at this point. And then we jump to... Uh, Marty Keough, an attorney, former aide to Peggy Davis Mullen for many years, uh, is now in fifth place. Jeff Ross, political activist, uh, formerly worked with uh, Diane Wilkerson, uh, and uh, the first uh, openly gay candidate running at large. He's doing very well. He's in sixth place. Um, uh, Anissa Asabi George uh, is an, in the Seventh place, that would be, at 4.8%. And Jack Kelly, who's uh, had a rather inspirational story uh, coming out of uh, Charlestown, battling an addiction, and uh, now uh, Neighborhood Services uh, liaison in Charlestown. He appears to be the eighth candidate. Catherine O'Neill, a former colleague of ours here at BNN, coming up just short, it appears, uh, uh, to make the runoff. And then Althea Garrison. There were 19 candidates in that race, a uh, huge field, and uh, uh, as a result of the uh, departure of, of course, uh, uh, Felix Arroyo, John Connolly, both at-large counselors, and Rob Consalvo and Mike Ross, a district counselors, also gave up their seats to run for mayor. Uh, the, uh, the Boston City Council will have a, uh, a face change, certainly, uh, at least uh, four new faces and perhaps more on there, and uh, I think we have some district results as well. Um, now we go to uh, District 4, Charles Yancey, of course uh, the only person running for mayor and running for re-election to his district seat at the same time, comfortably in the lead in his District 4. That's uh, Mattapan, parts of Dorchester, parts of, uh, of Roslindale, he's got over 65 percent. Terrence Williams, uh, who uh, runs a youth mission, uh, is in second place, and he appears to be the other uh, candidate that will go on to the uh, finals. And if we go to, let's see if we have, we have District 1, and uh, there's Sal LaMatina, the incumbent, a very comfortable lead, uh, appears to be well on his way to re-election. Brian Gannon, an anti-casino uh, activist in second, and he appears to be the other candidate in the runoff. And we're waiting for some numbers. There they are. Uh, District 8, uh, Josh Zakem, the namesake of uh, uh, Lenny Zakem, um, the uh, anti-discrimination activist, late, whom the bridge is named for, seems to be doing very well there, 45.3%. Michael Nichols, uh, city council chief of staff, uh, looks to be the other candidate in that race. Uh, and we're also waiting for some numbers for District 5, and I don't know if we have those yet. Uh, uh, we're still waiting on them, and we're also going to have uh, the complete numbers from the mayoral race, uh, the other candidates in that race as well. Again, uh, uh, joining me in studio, uh, 
from the uh, State House, uh, Representative Aaron Michaelwitz, and we've got just a, a minute or two left, uh, Aaron. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, uh, how will things change? You know, I, I think people at the State House, uh, the, in the Boston delegation, has always been very strong and very united. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but they, and they work well with uh, Mayor Menino, mm -hmm. but we're now about to have not just in the mayor's office but the council major changes. Mm -hmm. Will that change the way you do business with City Hall and your colleagues in the State House do business? No, I don't think so. I think we will, you know, we will continue to work with the City Council, with the mayor, whoever that may be. Uh, you know, I think it's a uh, it's a good part. It was it's been a good partnership under Mayor Menino. We've we've butted heads at certain times. Uh, you know, uh, when, when, when the time was right or when, when something came up, like libraries, for instance, was an issue that we butted heads with the mayor on. Uh, but most of the time, you know, uh, we've had a pretty good working relationship, and I think that that will continue, uh, you know, with the city council and with whoever the mayor may be. Well, I want to thank you for coming in and joining us tonight. Thank uh, you for having uh, me. You know, I appreciate um, it. You know, you you cast your lot with the candidates. Yep. Sometimes you hit it, sometimes you don't. I just want to say that I was, you know, uh, I couldn't be more prouder of the way Charlotte, you know, ran a ra ran this race. She kept it very upbeat, very positive. Um, I got to know her even better as the campaign went on, and I, I just think very highly of her. And I'm very, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing what she does in the future and and, uh, and working with her on, on different levels. Well, and so. thank you. I'm sure she feels the same towards you. Yeah. Uh, we'll go now over to. Uh, my colleague, uh, who uh, has two more, two new guests uh, joining her to uh, analyze the results from today's uh, uh, preliminary election. We send it now over to uh, Seth McCoy. Seth? Thanks, Joe. Joining me now, Celeste Myers from No Eastie Casino and Chris Lovett, who, of course, if you're uh, watching BNN, you have seen Chris on his show, um, Neighborhood Network News. So I want to welcome you both to the program. So, Celeste, let's start with you. What do you think about tonight's results? Were you shocked? I was a little bit surprised. I didn't expect the, the turnout. I uh, naturally, I think, like a lot of other folks, anticipated that John Connolly would be taking the lead mm -hmm. and that second place would be uh, really a, a tough uh, uh, tie between um, Dan and, uh, and Marty. So, surprised. So, what surprised. does this mean for you in your efforts? Well, and just briefly give people at home, uh, you've been interviewed several times sure. here, but just in case people are watching and they're not sure. familiar. Sure, absolutely. So um, I'm co-chair of No Easty Casino. We've been working really hard since 2011 as a ballot question committee. Um, pretty much been the underdog in the race um, with the casino issue in East Boston and with the advent of the mayoral campaign in the broad field, um, Bill Walzak brought the conversation into the forefront mm -hmm. um, and, and recently Dan Connolly became much more more vocal on the issue so um, we had some anticipation that either Dan or Bill would, would have a, kind of a, a higher showing. Mm -hmm. Not to be the case though this time around. Right, right. So moving forward when you're looking at what the final two is, Marty Walsh, John Connolly, what will be your strategy to try to convince them, if you will, to change their positions? Do sure. you think that's even possible? Well, I think many of the candidates um, have played a pretty high level um, race so far, mm -hmm. just having so much ground to cover. Mm -hmm. And hopefully as the field narrows, they'll have a little bit more opportunity to take a deeper dive. Mm -hmm. um, neither have given me the sense um, in personal conversations that they're strongly for a casino mm -hmm. in, in the city of Boston. Mm -hmm. um, and with you know, not necessarily having um, any kind of um, movement uh, on the casino front, uh, it's really important, you know, what path they'll take. So hopefully they'll continue the dialogue that Dan and, 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 uh, and Bill started. Chris, obviously this is going to be an important issue, the casino issue. What other issues do you see are going to come into focus now, clearly with so many candidates leading up until today? A lot of the issues got sort of um, lost in the shuffle, if you will, not a lot of focus on them. So what do you see as being the focus now? I, I think there still will be a lot of focus on education. And I think uh, Conley has been a lot more explicitly reformist around that. But, you know, Marty Walsh has some reform credentials as well. He helped found, uh, or at least got very active in uh, one of the charter schools in Dorchester. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think there would be maybe more talk about uh, what that strong union support for him will mean. Mm -hmm in the future. We have a number of city contracts that are coming up and there are indications that uh, the uh, the last settlement with the firefighters raises the bar for a good many unions. So I think there's going to be a lot more scrutiny 
of that coming down. Absolutely. And obviously they're going to have to decide on a, a number of issues. One being that Commissioner Ed Davis announced uh, that he's going to be leaving. So that's an important role to fill. Um, any thoughts on who you think the next mayor should? And obviously we're a little far away because we still have to get to November to see who that the next mayor is. But any thoughts on how whoever comes into office? And clearly this, this is going to be a question that both Marty and John are going to be asked during the next six weeks. Any thoughts on what direction they should take, advice you would give them? Sure. With the casino being my forte, look, John Connolly came out very early on before May Menino decided that he was not going to, to continue in this race. Mm -hmm. So I think that he's had a lot of opportunity, um, you know, sitting um, from the sidelines on, on city council since 2007 um, to have a sense of what he'd like to do differently. Mm -hmm. So chances are that he may um, have a short list of who he might select, mm -hmm. um, where Marty, being a union guy, you know, has probably spent a lot of time reconnecting with his union brothers and, and may have a short list of his own. So mm -hmm. it would be really interesting. I think either one of them um, is going to take the opportunity to do things differently and perhaps Ed assume that probably has an opportunity and, and decided to, to make that decision for himself early on. I want to um, take a minute right now. We have Tim McCarthy who is calling in from um, Hyde Park. He, of course, was one of the uh, eight candidates out in District 5 for the seat that was previously held by Rob Consalvo. Tim, are you on the line? I am, Seth. How are you? I'm good. How are you? So you, you... I am uh, I am very good, actually. <laughs> Thank you very much for asking. You're welcome. So you are going on to um, November. You came in first place, followed by, um, I believe, Jean-Claude Sanon is uh, is the the second place finisher. So what um, what are you going to do in the next six weeks to make sure that you are the final finisher in November? Well, I tell you what, uh, you know, we started out in April, and what we what we did is we knocked every single door in the entire district, and that's what we plan on doing again in the next six weeks. Uh, you know, the funny story was I, I've got two boys, uh, 13 and 15, and they've been uh, they've been door knocking beasts with me. They've been unbelievable, uh, giving up uh, hot summer days to go knock with the dad. It's been a, it's been a great experience and a team, you know, a, a really a bonding experience with my boys. But we're driving to the uh, the Trinity School uh, up in High Park today. And, my boys opened that poll, so they dressed the poll the night before, and they opened the poll in the morning. And my 15-year-old, he looked at me and said, hey, Dad, I, got, I have good vibes. I think we're going to win. We, we worked really hard. And I said, thanks, buddy. I think we're going to win, too. And he said, yeah, but we have another six weeks of this on. I said, yeah, that's right. We have another six weeks of this. So uh, that's exactly what we're going to do. Um, we've, uh, we, we've really gotten out there, and, and, you know, I think it's all about hitting the ground and running, making sure you get up into people's doors and make sure they, they know that you, you feel that you're the best qualified candidate. And, making sure that uh, they understand that, that, uh, that you are the best qualified candidate and convincing them that you are. And, uh, and that's what it's really all about. And, uh, I've, I've, got a, I've got a great vision of what I, what I feel High Park should be and what I feel mm -hmm. Rosendale should be and, and, uh, and the change that Mattapan needs to, uh, needs to take. Mm -hmm. So you're not, a, go. you're not a newcomer to campaigning, certainly. Uh, you worked for Mayor Menino for a number of years. What, was, what did you find different this time when your name is on the ballot? Well, I think the strangest part of the uh, the entire process really was standing up in front of a meeting and not representing Tom Menino. Mm -hmm. um, that was a strange, strange feeling to, to, to stay. It's all about me, what, what I feel and what I'm ready to do, and um, that was fantastic. But, you know, I think uh, we both have a background in, in working in neighborhoods and in community building and collaborating. And I think that the, the biggest uh, lesson that I've learned from from the mayor is that if, what's outside your front door is the most important. And, you know, the, the candidates will talk about schools and they'll talk about policing and they'll talk about transportation and all of the big issues that they want to talk about. But really, if they look out their front door and they're not happy with what they see, they're going to leave. Mm -hmm. And if you start having people leave, then, then that, that's going to be the, that, you know, the detriment of the city. So uh, basic city service is always the key to make sure that uh, the people in Boston are happy with where they are. Great. Well, Tim, I don't want to keep you on the phone because I know you have some celebrating to do. Um, so thank you for calling in and um, best of luck in the next few weeks. All right, Seth. I appreciate it very much and look forward to chatting with you again. Absolutely. Thank you. Take care, my friend. Bye-bye. Bye. So, Chris, Tim mentioned something that's probably very important to all of the residents of the city, and that is the basic city service deliveries. Um, when people have a pothole on their street, a street light out, 
moving forward between Marty and John, Marty Walsh and John Conley, who are the top two finishers in this mayor's race, do you have any indication or would you even want to say who you think might be uh, in that same vein as Tom Menino? I, I think uh, Connolly has made it sound as if he wants to take Menino to another level. I think you might remember his campaign pitch <laughs> outside the Apple store. Yep. And, and I've heard this in the neighborhoods too, that they, they want city government to be even more uh, accountable, uh, approachable, inaccessible, intelligible even. And uh, so I, I think he's got the right concept, but as far as delivering on that, I, I wouldn't uh, assume at the outset that uh, it would be any uh, um, less than set with, 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 with Marty Walsh. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I need some more time to look it over, and I think that's what the voters want too. They, they want to hear these people and get a sense of how they'll do it. Do you think it's going to be hard for either candidate to whoever finishes in November to live up to the legend that Tom Menino created? I, I think uh, the hardest thing is just going to be dealing with not so much the legends of the past, but, but the facts of the future. Mm -hmm. Because, yes, I know right now we have a building boom, there's, there's new property tax revenue coming, there's a new casino going up, maybe. So, <laughs> not uh, if I mean, Celeste so not if Celeste can do anything <laughs> about it. But these are all things that I think both candidates are going to be really focused on. I think the voters are too. We're not going to get into this for, for nostalgia. Right? We have challenges ahead of us, we have opportunities ahead of us, and I think that's what they're going to be looking at. What about in 2017? Do you think we'll see another um, campaign like this, campaign season, where we have 12 candidates for mayor, 19 for at-large city councilor? I would be surprised, uh, unless uh, whoever gets elected either moves on or, or you know, finds a new uh, reason for living, but uh, I, I see this periodically. Uh, we had this 20 years ago. Uh, not quite as many candidates, but we had a change of command in City Hall. We had a change of command in 83, uh, going back to 67. So you always have more competition, more people. Um, and I think, you know, in the midst of this, we, we, we think that whoever's going to be elected is going to face a vigorous challenge four years from now. And more often than not, they don't. Right, right, absolutely. Celeste, do you think that the next mayor, should we look at implementing term limits? Uh, a lot of people have talked about Mayor Menino has been there for 20 years, he's done a great job, but is 20 years too long? Um, I'd be reluctant to say whether or not I think 20 years is too long, but to kind of um, take a step back to the question you just asked Chris, I think that um, a lot of folks were reluctant because the term was so long to mm -hmm. stick, their, stick their toe in the water, and I think John Connolly was, was very brave to do so. But that being said, I think this field of 12 may be narrowed in the next four years, but I think that there are many that have have been energized, your Dan Connolly's, your Bill Walzak's, mm -hmm. um, and, se and several others, um, Gola Ritchie. Um, and I Who think we will see them. She finished a strong third. Right. So I, I think we will see those folks come back. Mm -hmm. I think they're taking away some lessons learned. I think on the outset, most people don't expect to win their first race, yeah. certainly not the mayor of the city of Boston. Right. So I, I wouldn't be so quick to say that whoever takes the seat in January won't face uh, competition in four years. And I want to talk a little bit about the at-large race because certainly that's probably going to be something that you're targeting as you're looking forward to uh, trying to stop a casino from coming into East Boston. There are a lot of different candidates on the ballot moving forward, just going through the list. Councilor Presley, Michael Flaherty, Council President Murphy, Michelle Wu, Marty Keough, Jeff Ross, Anissa Asabi-George, and Jack Kelly. So. Obviously, you're targeting candidates, making sure that they know what your position is. Sure. Um, out of those candidates that are in the top eight now, are you comfortable with the fact that you might be able to at least connect with many of them to, to convince them to support your position to not have a casino in East Boston? Well, uh, I'm hoping to. Of those that you listed, um, you know, several are current sitting city councilors and, um, you know, uh, Ayanna Presley is against a casino, but I'm not so convinced that she doesn't believe that it's a done deal. Um, Michelle Wu, I know that she um, is averse to plans for a casino in the city of Boston. Um, the rest, I don't have a, you know, a, a firm hold mm -hmm. of, of what their viewpoint is. 
Um, you know, I was at the hearing at City Hall on, on Friday where they were talking about the venue and the date. Uh, so I, I look forward to the opportunity to connect with these folks and to get a sense because um, although um, it is it is popular um, belief that it is a Dundale and that it is coming, um, and, and a lot of folks, even though they're against a casino in Boston, they may think that um, a casino in the region is imminent, so they, they'd rather opt for Boston, but to really kind of educate them that they do have the ability it's to impact this. Well, so is Everett not a done deal? It's certainly not a done deal. So they um, did win the referendum vote. However, the application still needs to be submitted to the State Gaming Commission, mm -hmm. and it can be dismissed by the State Gaming Commission for a number of reasons. That's important for people to know, because a lot of people say, if, if not East Boston, then Everett right. will get impacts and we won't get benefits. And I think that's important to point out because a lot of people do think it's a done deal um, and the Gaming Commission has the final say. In their own words, broad discretion. Mm -hmm. Broad discretion to interpret um, the bill mm -hmm. and to execute on applications as they see fit. Mm -hmm. and, um, and nothing's a given. And at the highest level, um, the application, from my perspective and from many others, seems substandard mm -hmm. um, efforts as it stands now. Um, East Boston also substandard and folks need to realize that too that um, at the end of the day we're facing very very major impacts mm -hmm. and really no guarantees right. it's easy to get heady when they talk about millions and millions of dollars but when you see how it really breaks down and filters down to the average resident and business mm -hmm. owner not one cent is guaranteed well i think a lot of the concern that some people have and i'm not sure if this is your concern but the fact that if there is a casino built in either boston or in everett you're basically a two dollar tea ride away from gambling away a paycheck. Absolutely, and that drains the revenues from the main streets mm -hmm. and from the city of Boston mm -hmm. and from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. Sheer proximity to the airport makes a proposition of a casino in Everett or East Boston probably the most costly one in the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. And I'm, you know, uh, loath to, to say that you know, uh, no one should have a casino in Massachusetts, but I have yet to see a proposal. I have yet to think of an instance where it would be an added benefit. Mm -hmm. These folks know we're the largest tourist destination in the nation, fourth. We're ahead of Disney World. They're coming to take the money away. They're not really coming to bring us anything. So if a casino happens in East Boston, will you move out of the city? You know, I, I wonder that often. Um, we... Uh, <laughs> are fortunate to work side by side with some uh, tried and true activists in East Boston, mm -hmm. folks that have been battling the airport for 40 years. Mm -hmm. When I look at the next 40 years of my life, I don't really see it battling a casino. Mm -hmm. So that's that's an important question. I know many folks have told me that if multi-generational East Bostonians that say that they will move out of the area and they will, they will go someplace else. Chris, are you surprised that there has been some, there have been some people who are um, talking about that issue that Celeste just brought up about battling the airport for 40 plus years who maybe came out against the casino initially uh, and now are in support of one. I, I think uh, for some people, and this is not everybody, but uh, you know, the casino is in a way like Massport. You know? The, the airport's been a source of much grief for East Boston, but a lot of people got jobs. <laughs> True. And, and I'm, I'm not saying that if something else had been there instead of an airport, uh, it, it would have been worse. Uh, I'm just saying people it, see it as a tangible mm -hmm. benefit, at least, and it's very easy to focus on the positive part of it. I think what Celeste says about the regional drain mm -hmm. on the economy, and aside from moral hazards and the toll of gambling addiction, uh, I think that has to be taken seriously, but it's also a lot more diffuse than someone saying, oh, I can get a job there if I call uh, some city councilor right. or a state rep. Right, and that's certainly not the way it works uh, much these days anyway in terms of getting those jobs. But I also think that you're right. I think that if a casino is placed in East Boston, what happens to all of the mom and pop restaurants that are in the neighborhood? Do those you know, dry up because people are just going to the casino to, to gamble? Um, and then clearly there are going to be restaurants in the casino. Um, and how does that impact the residents of East Boston and, and also the whole city? Sure. Um, well, as you described, the, a casino in East Boston will only be a $2 tea right, tea right away. Um, and that's a drain on the main streets. And when you talk about those small mom and pop operations, a lot of these operations are run by folks that are already working one or two full-time jobs. They're taking out of their pockets on a weekly basis to keep the operations afloat. A minute diversion of revenues, a small percentage, leaves their operation and heads to the casino. 
that's going to be enough to kill them. And it won't be immediate. It won't be like your big um, department stores or grocery chains that can do the six-month projections and, and, and forecast where they're going to be taking a bad turn. These folks are going to die a slow, painful death. And what they'll leave behind is a boarded up, blighted storefront. And even the more resilient businesses will deal with the exponential um, drain in their supply chain. They'll have to pick up the tab for consumer goods and services, mm -hmm. insurance, um, and taxes and the like. That that doesn't go away. And what happens is all that money gets funneled into the casino and people talk about it going out of state close by. Well, it's going to Vegas mm -hmm. and it's going to Montana to Richard Field's bank account. It right. won't be staying close to home in the Commonwealth. Right. Chris, do you think that we will get a citywide vote on the casino or do you think it will maintain uh, jurisdiction in East Boston? Well, if this is just up to the city council looking at the people who are on the council right now or the candidates who seem to have a chance of winning, it, it looks as if it's still going to be a vote in favor of just having a decision made in East Boston. And you have to remember too, when, when you combine that with a benefits package that's offered to East Boston, that also skews the vote in a way. Uh, because if you have a citywide vote and you've got a benefits package for just one neighborhood, then that also has effect on the vote. Well, and I think also the residents of East Boston will look at that and say, oh, well, we're getting all this money to, to beautify our neighborhood, and that's a great thing. Um, and certainly somebody the other day made the connection that, well, we don't, if Harvard's doing development in Austin or Brighton, the city doesn't vote on whether or not that can happen. But Chris, do you view this as a little, that's sort of like an apples and oranges comparison? Uh, I think only so far because the city um, does have some kind of zoning control over Harvard. Not, not a whole lot <laughs> because Harvard has all this land. They have a lot of leverage. But I, I think uh, you've you got to remember there's also a point that people like the head of ABC, D. John Drew, has. He says, look, there are a lot of people from all over the city and beyond who would go there and, and gamble. And uh, they're disproportionately poor. And uh, most of them are not getting any benefits from this casino, except from maybe a few token gestures along the way. So uh, the, the, he has a point. Yeah. Well, this is definitely an issue that is going to be on the forefront in the next six weeks with the mayor's race and the at-large uh, city council race. Celeste, I want to thank you for being here. Chris, thank you. And we are going to throw it back to Joe Heisler, who's got a couple more guests joining him right now. Thank you, Seth. And uh, tonight, of course, what a night it's been as we've been reviewing the results from today's preliminary election. Uh, the numbers are all in. Um, they are unofficial numbers. It'll take the city a couple of days to verify them, but uh, uh, they are what they are, so to speak, and uh, as Bill Belichick might say, and uh, let's review them va very quickly, and then we'll do a, a final analysis and wrap up with a couple of very special guests. Uh, first off, uh, to uh, District 1, Sal LaMantina, the incumbent, easily sweeping to victory there and appears to be well on his way towards re-election. Brian Gannon, an anti-casino activist uh, in second. He will make the runoff, it appears. John Ribeiro, third. And now we go to District 4. Charles Yancey very comfortably uh, uh, in the lead there on his way back uh, to the Boston City Council. He was not successful in the mayor's race, the only candidate running for both. Terrence Williams, a uh, who runs a mission for uh, youth uh, is uh, the other candidate that will make the runoff, and we'll see if that turns into a, a race in the final election. Now we go to District 5, and uh, this was a very tight, uh, eight candidates in all. Uh, Tim McCarthy, a, a public works employee who's uh, done several different jobs at City Hall for Mayor Menino coming out of Reedville with the lead, 24.3%. And Jean-Claude Senan, uh, he, uh, a uh, independent businessman in Hyde Park, uh, drawing heavily and uh, uh, making an issue of, uh, of uh, who represents the district. He is, of course, uh, uh, Haitian. And um, that looks like it could be a very close race in the final. Next up. District 8, that's, this is the seat that Mike Ross gave up to run for mayor. And uh, Josh Zakem, the uh, namesake of uh, Lenny Zakem, um, very comfortable lead there. Michael Nichols, uh, city council, chief of staff in second and on his way to the runoff. And 
Here we go, at large, and these have not changed. Again, these are all with the 100% uh, reporting. Ayanna Presley, uh, the incumbent counsel, at large counselor, uh, topping ticket, Michael Flaherty making a, a bid for a comeback uh, in second. Steve Murphy, the city council president, in third. Uh, Michelle Wu, a newcomer, Harvard Law School grad, uh, who's running strong in fourth, and the rest of the field that, again, here, only the top eight go on to the final. They are Marty Keel, Jeff Ross, uh, uh, Nisa, Isabi George, and Jack Kelly. Uh, our former colleague, Catherine O'Neill, seems to have come up short in her bid to uh, join the Boston City Council. And finally, again, here's the uh, mayor's results. You've seen them. They have not changed all night. Basically, Marty Walsh, uh, State Representative Marty Walsh from uh, Dorchester, um, topping the ticket, 18.5%. Second place, at-large City Councilor John Connolly, 17.2%. They will make the runoff, the final in November. Charlotte Golar Ritchie coming up uh, short in her bid to become, uh, make some history, become the first African-American elected, and first woman elected mayor. Uh, Suffolk DA Dan Connolly, who had a very nice uh, campaign fund, uh, didn't seem to help him tonight, unfortunately, 11.3. Here's the rest of them. And uh, Charles Clemens, uh, owns a co-founder of a radio station, 1.5%. Bill Walzak, former CEO of, uh, of the Codman Square Health Center, 3.4%. Charles Yancey, 2.1%. The counselor ran uh, for both seats. Robbie Consalvo, who uh, many th people thought might uh, have a shot to uh, crack the uh, top two, 7.6%. He gave up his seat. Charlotte Gola Ritchie saw that one, 13.8%. Michael Ross ran strong, went, ran a very good campaign at 7.2%. And here's the rest. Of course, Marty Walsh at 18.5%. John Connolly, 17.2%. Felix Arroyo, who also gave up his at-large council seat, 8.8%. Uh, David James Wyatt, a uh, fringe candidate, less than one. John Connolly, John Barrows, uh, who did very well, 8.1%, but not well enough. He's uh, formerly. Joining me now, live in studio, uh, analysts to, uh, to look at uh, what worked and what didn't work for the candidates. And I want to introduce him on my left. Uh, uh, he is the executive editor of Commonwealth Magazine, well-known Boston journalist, uh, Michael Jonas, and a uh, familiar face, uh, now a successful businessman as well, former Boston City Councilor uh, John Tobin. Uh, Thanks, just Jill. opened uh, his new comedy club, Laugh Boston. Congratulations Thanks, on that. Thanks, so, Appreciate it. Thanks both for coming in. All right, let's talk quickly what, what went right, what went wrong. Uh, there's many... Should we be surprised that John Connolly and Martin, Marty Walsh ended up on top? Uh, I, I don't think so. I mean, I think you saw the two superior ground games uh, at work today. Uh, Marty Walsh with uh, about 1,500 people on the, on the streets today. In the last week, it was not unusual to uh, drive around to see on the streets of Boston men and women, uh, clearly workers with construction boots on, out with clipboards canvassing neighborhoods. Um, and John Connolly, who got into this race before anybody else did, uh, who's put together a pretty good network of support uh, around the city, uh, you know, since since being elected to the city council in, in 2007, and even going back to his unsuccessful bid in 2005. So this is not New York City. This is not a, a an air war uh, with uh, where you bombard it with necessarily with commercials. Uh, this is very much still a small city, a walkable city, a city where you should be able to get to every single voter at their doors or in front of a supermarket. Ground game. Michael, uh, you've been following the race as well. Uh, uh, no shockers there, but no. maybe, uh, uh, maybe we should talk more about who, who didn't do well. I mean, uh, some thought that, in, not to focus solely on her, but that uh, Charlotte Gola or Richie, she did come in third, but uh, that uh, uh, she could put it all together, uh, especially now that Boston is a uh, majority of people of, of color. What happened or what went wrong there? I think you're right. She, she had a lot of potential. As people said from the start, she, she struck fear, frankly, into, into all the other candidates when she got into this race. Uh, she brought uh, a, a strong resume to the race, but what she didn't end up 
uh, delivering was really an effective message during the campaign or a, a strong cam campaign operation that could really ever ever get off the ground. She started, got into the race a little bit late, and uh, uh, had a hard time finding her footing and, and coming up with a message. I think it was hard for her in particular to, uh, to try to figure out whether she was going to try to uh, project a change message in the race, which was something a lot of the candidates struggled with given the popularity that outgoing, the outgoing mayor, uh, Tom Menino, uh, still enjoys in the city. She was you know, particularly identified with the mayor having been uh, so a reluctance to criticize for fear of uh, ruffling of the, the uh, well, I don't know if an 800-pound gorilla has feathers, but... Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, I don't think there was, I don't think she was reluctant to, I mean, I don't think she had, there were great differences between her and the mayor, but I, I, I felt like her message, again, which didn't, you know, didn't have a lot in terms of policy specifics to it, she talked about uh, uniting the city, bringing it together, it implied somehow that the city indirectly was fractured or needed to be united, but she never really went far with, with, with sort of suggesting that that was the case either. So I think that there was just sort of a difficulty uh, uh, putting together a message, and, and frankly, there were a lot of other strong candidates in the field, right. and you know, as got talked about quite a bit, there were several strong candidates from the minority community. Right. Um, you know, I think you know, that definitely hurt her in the well, end as well. Well, well, John, uh, not to pick on the Irish, but you know they've been battling it out, splitting the vote, uh, this, that for. Uh, well, let's pick years on We haven't had the seat in twenty uh, years. What are you talking yeah. about? <laughs> <laughs> and, and some people said uh, those days were gone. Yet here we end up with last name Walsh, last name Connolly. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, kind of in spite of that, uh, you know, coming full circle. Uh, uh, what, so, what, someone what, made, what's going someone on? Someone made a good point or, to me. Or is ethnic, even racial politics, not important anymore? I don't think it is. I don't think it is. I mean, I, it, but it's no secret that the two people going to the final are both current elected office holders uh, who have run uh, campaigns. Re I mean, John Connolly's in a, in a dogfight every two years uh, for Boston City Council. Ma uh, Marty Walsh, though he hasn't had really a contested race since he won the seat, I think in 1997, Michael. Right. Uh, still has labor, organized labor, and he's, he's ahead of the building trades, um, the, a job he gave up to, you know, to run for mayor. And so he has that at his disposal. Uh, it, this is, someone made a good point to me, this is the race that we're going to have, have now is the race we did not get, get in 1983. This is uh, the, when we didn't get Dave Finnegan versus uh, Ray Flynn in the final. Yep. Instead, Mel King uh, got into that final. So that's the, the race that should have been 30 years ago, well, was pre predicted to be by many, uh, is the race we're going to get this time? But uh, and I want to go back to the topic. Did did the uh, you know you talked about the candidates? Uh, uh, and again, you know, maybe it's unfair to look at it by race, ethnicity, that type of thing. Yet there was some thought that since there had never been an African American or a person of color elected mayor, that this was the year that somehow they would galvanize. There was a. Ra Rather, and I think some people would say ham-handed effort to kind of, uh, you know, either push some people out of the race or unify around a candidate, but that seemed to backfire, and uh, uh, the Globe in particular seemed to take offense. And, yeah. And, and, uh, and the reason, I think it backfired, Joe, because I think the city really is at a different place than it was uh, 20 or 30 years ago, where a message like that to unify might have might have had more currency and, and gotten more support. I think people took offense at the idea that voters should uh, coalesce strictly on that basis. And I think people looked at some of the other candidates. They saw John Barros, who was coming on strong, a very uh, and did uh, very well. Impressive uh, candidate, yeah, gained, gained quite well. a bit. I think he ended up finishing ahead of uh, Consalvo yeah. uh, by a small margin in there. So I, I, I and I think, I think that there's going to be a lot of talk about the fact that in 2013... And, and finger-pointing and backbiting? And, and, and that in 2013, you know, Boston, a city with such a tortured history around race, now sort of a, a, as we're pointing toward the future, we have two white guys in the final. And I, I think that could be... That hand can be overplayed. I think that... Uh, I think we could very well have had a minority candidate in the final. We could very well have had a strong candidate emerge who won the mayor's... Uh, seat. I really think it's less a function of sort of the city being dug in around those issues than than just the uh, uh, the field of candidates that emerged. I just don't think we had a candidate that was strong enough this time around. There are other candidates um, 
that I that I think of. Uh, uh, not to not not to single her out, uh, it, it, although I, I'll do it in a way that I think is flattering. But uh, I was just earlier tonight at John Barrows's party where I ran into Marie Saint Fleur, who uh, former state rep, right. also from Dorchester, who was supporting uh, John this time around. Uh, I, I always thought that she would be a, a incredibly powerful citywide candidate. Mm -hmm. She's someone who has a, a, a magnetism and a uh, an ability to really. Uh, inspire right. passion. Self assuredness. Uh, she also, I think, is somebody who, like John, and also like John Conley, like a number of the other candidates, I think, could have really been uh, pushing a reform message around school issues that seems to have resonated. I mean, it's another point we haven't talked about that the candidates finishing, in this case, in the top three, all uh, uh, happen to be the, the three white Irish guys they get described of in those terms, but they were also the three candidates who who were sort of embracing the, mm -hmm. one of the more aggressive stances on school reform, as was John Barrows, who, right. who frankly, so moved up a lot on the, the end. Put that, in, put that in the context now of the, uh, the, the, the final. Um, how, how does this split? And, and first of all, I, you know, I, and I asked a, a Representative Aaron Michaelwitz uh, this, and he didn't want to bite on this, but uh, uh, where does Mayor Menino go in this race? Some people have said, uh, Let's see, these are his two least favored candidates in the field, and maybe that's wrong, maybe that's unfair, but uh, does he still stay on the sidelines now? Uh, that's hard to say. I mean, only the mayor uh, knows that. I mean, I, I, a lot of, from what I've seen, a lot of people in City Hall are you know, doing their jobs and, and, and seeing the administration out. Mm -hmm. There have been a few people who, have you know, because of neighborhood alliances have gone on, you know, either with John or, or with Marty. Uh, but this race is, you know, this final is not about the mayor anymore. It's about, you know, this boils down to, this has been 12 people who have been traveling the city kind of like in, a, in one van, going around to four after four to debate, and you, you give 30, 45 second clipped answers to very substantive questions, and it's, it's hard to, now the spotlight is squarely on uh, these two individuals who uh, come from different parts of the city, uh, have really different uh, life backgrounds, um, and, and and it's really, the focus is going to really be you know, John's plank on, on education and jobs and, and Marty's on, on, on labor and, 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 and jobs, jobs and, and education. <laughs> at, and and, uh, in, in, in folks in, in substance abuse uh, and recovery. Yeah. Uh, it's a very, very interesting race. And I, you know, I just want to go back to something. I, I think this, is, this race was less about race than it was about timing. Uh, let's not forget, the mayor announced fairly late. Uh, late in March that he was not running, caught a lot of people by surprise, right. a lot of people. And I certainly don't think John Conley was privy to any inside information. Um, so people just weren't ready. Right. And in that then, way, John, it almost has a dynamic of like a special election. We keep saying special elections favor incumbents, people who are, yes. uh, who are ready to roll from yeah. day one. And, this, you know, and shortly like, after... But, but wait a minute, it didn't help Dan Conley. Well, it's not, okay, so you, you, have the, you, have the, you have the marathon uh, uh, tragedy that happens a few weeks later, so everybody's attention, rightly so, is diverted yeah. there. And then you get, you get the Bruins going, you get the Whitey Bulger trial, uh, you've, got, uh, you've, got, uh, the, you've got Aaron Hernandez, that story, and next, yeah. next thing you know, it's July 4th. And it's, as Michael and I were talking off here, you know, Charlotte had her, her kickoff party sometime in July at Hibernian Hall. That's not, you know, when Deval Patrick ran for governor, he was out, a, he he had the, a year, a year and a half in advance. Right. People couldn't pronounce his first name, uh, prior, but he had that year and a half to do that introduction. It's really tough to make an introduction to people when you've been out of office for a little while. Right. Well, with, you know, with going back to Dan, it's very tough, at least in the state, for AGs or people, uh, law enforcement folks, uh, to make that next level because if you're doing your job, uh, you're indicting people, you're arresting people, <laughs> uh, that's what you get known for. And uh, it's, not, yeah. uh, it, it's, it's not a lot of glad, glad handing. Now, uh, we've got just a minute or two left. Where do the, uh, where do the other the, the candidates that didn't make the runoff go? Uh, do they uh, jump on board here? Those calls uh, are being made right now. I would yeah. guarantee you that John Conley and Marty Walsh spent about all of about 20 minutes of their, at their campaign <laughs> parties, and they are racing right now uh, to Charlotte's, to, right. to, to Danny's, to Robbie, to Walzak, you, you know, pretty much from, from 3 to 11. Uh, in, the, in the candidates there and going around trying to get their support and get their supporters. Michael, you see uh, a breakdown there? Or any, uh, which way they go? Uh, you got the crystal ball? Well, not quite. I mean, I'm not that clear on how the, how the candidates themselves will go. I mean, I think it's in some ways almost more interesting to think about their bases of support, I mean, than the 
the, the voters that they had backing them and how those are going to divide up. So I think you know, there's a few things that are of interest. Obviously, as we've been talking about, the, the two finalists being uh, you know, white, white Irish male, so the minority vote in the city is really going to be a, a, a battleground in mm -hmm. this race. Uh, I think another thing you have to recognize is that there people kept talking about there, there was so much competition in the southwest part of the city for votes with John Conley, Dan Conley, Rob Consalvo all battling it out. Well, that area is now opening up. Hyde Park. It, uh, it looks you know, like it ought to be fairly friendly territory for John Conley to make some gains, but uh, you know, Walsh will certainly be in there too. And then you've got you know, what you might call sort of the in-town neighborhoods that did not figure, I think, that that uh, 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 that highly in today's race, it's always been the perennial question of whether you can get folks in those areas that don't turn out right. very high. Will they come high for numbers. the final? Will they? Can can either of these candidates make some appeal there that gets those folks interested in in, in oh. the city's future? Well, we shall see. Uh, again, uh, the results from today's preliminary election. Uh, we've got two finalists in the mayor's race, of course. Uh, Marty Walsh, uh, state representative from Dorchester, John Connolly, at large counselor from West Roxbury. They made the final according to the unofficial results. And uh, we look forward, like all of you, to the uh, final election. Joining me in this uh, final segment to talk about it, uh, former Boston City Councilor John Tobin and uh, Commonwealth Magazine Executive Editor Michael Jonas. Uh, Guys, I want to thank you both for joining us. Uh, we'll take one last look at the numbers before we go. And uh, just a reminder that uh, uh, throughout the uh, coming weeks, uh, we'll continue to uh, cover this race, these races, and we hope you'll join us here at BNN uh, uh, throughout the weeks that come. Uh, here are the final numbers uh, very quickly before we sign off. Uh, in District 1, the... Uh, Councilor Sal LaMatina and Brian Cannon make the uh, runoff. And uh, in District 4, Charles Yancey is back, uh, the councilor, and his opponent, Terrence Williams. In District 5, Tim McCarthy coming out of Reedville, a, a city employee against Jean-Claude Senan. And in District 8, Josh Zakem, uh, namesake of of uh, Lenny Zakem and Michael Nichols from the Boston City Council Chief Staff. And at large, the top eight out of 19 are going on to the final. They are Ayanna Presley, uh, Michael Flaherty, uh, Councilor uh, Steve Murphy, the City Council President, Michelle Wu, uh, Marty Keel, Jeff Ross, uh, Anissa Isabi George, and Jack Kelly. And uh, as we mentioned before, the two winners tonight in the mayor's race, Marty Walsh and John Connolly. And I want to thank all of our viewers for joining us tonight, and I want to especially st thank the staff here at BNN TV, the production uh, crew. It's been a labor of love. They're great people, and they've done a great job tonight. Uh, on behalf of my colleague, Seth McCoy, I want to thank you for watching. I'm Joe Heisler. And we'll be back next week with our regular edition of Talk of the Neighborhoods Monday at 8 p.m. Until then, have a pleasant evening. Good night.